The regular meeting number nine of the 95-96 year, this date, November 13th, 1995. The roll call, please, by the town clerk. Chairman Cogsall? Here. Council Chapel? Yep. Council Jordan? Yep. Council Linnell? Here. Council McGinty? Here. Council McLaughlin? Here. And Council Reed? Here. I ask you all to join us for the Pledge of Allegiance to <coughs> the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is another special moment to recognize special citizens of Cape Elizabeth um, and give them a, a procl proclamation and resolutions from the town council. I had the opportunity on Thursday, October 26th to go to a meeting that was held in Portland that was sponsored by the Junior League Community Council on Youth in Portland. And I signed a proclamation um, declaring <clears throat> that along with other elected officials in the greater Portland area, to um, try to do the best we can to fight against violence in the home um, and try to make the world a much better place for children in which to live. And in conjunction with that, as a special uh, resolution, I'd like to present to Senator Jane A. Amaro this resolution. Whereas Jane A. Amaro serves Cape Elizabeth and other communities in the Maine State Senate, and whereas Senator Amaro has assisted municipalities, including Cape Elizabeth, by defending a fairer school funding formula, shepherding legislation to reform municipal payroll and warrant practices, and co-sponsoring efforts to reform Cumberland County government. Whereas Senator Amaro recently worked with the Cape Elizabeth Police Department to enact legislation to protect citizens who have been victims of spousal abuse and children who have been victims of sexual abuse. And whereas the town of Cape Elizabeth Town Council wishes to acknowledge the exceptional cooperation from Senator Amaro in working with the town council and other local officials. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby thank Senator Jane A. Amaro for all her efforts for Cape Elizabeth and for our most vulnerable citizens, and we wish her well with the issues that will be before the Maine Legislature in 1996, dated this 13th day of November in the year of 1995 at Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and signed by all of the councillors. Senator Amaro, would you please come forward? That's a dangerous thing to ask a politician to say. Well. But no, it, it, thank you so much from my heart to all the council members. You know, I think it's really important that we have more people up in Augusta now who have served on local town councils because I think that really helps to make a difference in uh, the kind of legislation that we pass up there because those of us who have served at the local level knows what state mandates are going to mean. Uh, to local people, and I've really been so fortunate to work with so, so many great people in Cape Elizabeth and getting what I think are some uh, very positive pieces of legislation passed in this last session, and I certainly appreciate and want to thank you so much for this honor. And now I'd like to present a town council resolution um, for the State of Maine Boys Soccer Champions. Whereas the boy, Cape Elizabeth Boys Soccer Team recently won the Maine State Schoolboy Class A Soccer Championship, and whereas the team honored Cape Elizabeth and themselves by making the eighth straight appearance in a state final in 10 years, and whereas the team's overall record of 17 wins and one loss is indicative of dedication to practice, 
good athletic skills, and an aspiration for continued achievement. And whereas the Town Council of Cape Elizabeth and all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth wish to express our pride in the boys' soccer team for earning this distinction, now therefore be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby congratulate and honor the boys' soccer team on their championship finish and we thank them for representing our community so well. Dated this 13th day of, December, of November in the year of 1995 at Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and signed by all of the town councilors, and I believe their coach, Andy Stroud, is here. Would you come up and bring your team with you? I'd just like to uh, thank the council very much. It, it's awful nice to be um, the state champions, obviously, but it's, it's so nice to have a great community as we do, and the support that we get from the community throughout the, the year has been fantastic. It's pretty obvious that it's just not this group of boys that uh, win the state championship. It's the entire community, because these guys have been here in this community growing up through the programs that we have offered here really results in this championship. So we thank you very, very much. Madam Chair, can I make a comment quickly? Yes. Um, I went up to Augusta to watch that game. I know that Councillor uh, Reed was also up there, maybe others that I didn't see. I know under the conditions that they were playing, it was cold, definitely cold, and windy. And uh, I crossed the field after the game, and the field was in terrible condition. And just the, the skill um, that the players showed playing under those conditions, uh, I think, made their victory uh, all that more important. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairman. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, just to, the, just to the team, I've come a long way since I played soccer with your coach uh, back in the summer leagues. Uh, but I, I, one thing I didn't understand was uh, if you lost, they'd lost a game, and I'd like to know who was that? Who'd you lose to? Was it Brazil? I mean. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Reed, you'd like to make a comment? And it was a Saturday game. Okay. The only one, I think. I'd like to, um, of course, I'm a proud parent of one of the members of the team, but I would like to just comment on the fact that. Uh, the coach, the captains, and the players really handled themselves extremely well throughout the entire season. And I would like to uh, thank the team for representing the town. And I'd like to thank the town for coming out to watch so many of the athletic contests uh, that our student athletes participate in. Thank you. And now it's another town council resolution for the state of Maine girls cross country champions. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth girls cross country team recently won the Maine State School, School Girl Class C cross country team championship, and whereas the team honored Cape Elizabeth and themselves by earning the first state championship in this sport since 1979, whereas the balanced effort among the full team is indicative of dedication to practice, good athletic skills, and an aspiration for continued achievement, and whereas the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth wish to express our pride in the girls' cross-country team for earning this distinction. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby congratulate and honor the girls' cross-country team on their championship finish, and we thank them for representing our community so well. Dated this 13th day of November, in the year 1965 at Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and signed by all the counselors. If the team would please come forward. Our coach was unable to be here tonight, but I'd really like to thank the town council and the town of Cape Elizabeth 
Winning the state championship was something that this team has wanted to do all season. And not only did we have the talent, but the four seniors in our top seven really had the determination to win, and that led us to a state championship on a really, really cold November day. And another announcement that was brought to my attention just this evening, and I'm afraid I don't have a proclamation at the moment, but another group of very successful young achievers, the 1995 Challenge Cup champions for the under-14 girls in the Casco Bay Soccer Club Cougars. The coaches were Bob Ritchie and Dan Fisher, and the players were Jen Alpert, Shannon Bailey. Monica Bergman, Corey Dunphy, Susie Etzel, Julie Fisher, Mercedes Marino, Allison McGinnis, Kristen Ritchie, Elizabeth Sullivan, Molly Thompson, Lisa Williams, Leslie Willis, and Hannah Zimprich. And we want to thank all those players and their coaches who are Cape Elizabeth residents. Congratulations to them, even though you're not here. The next item on the agenda um, is our, the citizen discussion period of items not on the agenda. Are there any citizens that wish to come forward to make a statement? Would you please come to the microphone and give us your name and address? Um, my name is Roy Dunphy. I was the uh, former president of the Casco Bay Soccer Club. I'm now uh, currently a director there of fields. And I've had an awards night uh, Sunday evening uh, for the club that was uh, reasonably well intended at the Capitorium. And uh, thinking about fields and the problems we had last spring, I quickly put together this petition that you have in front of you. Uh, the petition states uh, basically that we would like uh, uh, be able to double line fields in the spring season starting in March uh, what it previously and and also to have equipment available to play soccer uh, last season three teams participating uh, two state champions who had to uh, play on to the regionals uh, because of school policy or uh, the powers to be uh, they were not allowed to line any fields until June, mid-June. So we had played two months and practiced two and a half months without a line field, and uh, we didn't get goalposts up until then either. So we played our games with cones. Uh, I don't see that this is uh, really helping uh, volunteers in this town that we put our time in, and we don't have any cooperation. I think it's just a matter of sharing, and uh, I. Uh, would like uh, the community to understand that uh, we are very willing to uh, to help uh, in the field situation as far as fundraising but uh, to be put on the back burner and treated like this uh, is uh, I don't think uh, is widely known and we would like this to be corrected so that why the petition was uh, uh, put forth with 135 uh, May, uh, Cape Elizabeth residents signing. The other part uh, is the Cape Elizabeth School Department use of facility guidelines and policies. Uh, down in the last paragraph, sports seasons. Uh, this was put together, I assume, by the people in the school department and the community services. Uh, we weren't contacted about this until the last meeting, which I was unable to attend because of prior commitment. But uh, this came out shortly after. But in this, it states that in sports seasons, in-season sports, referred to in the dates below, receive priority use of facilities. Well, in winter sports, it states basketball, swimming, indoor track. And it states the dates that they are played from the third week of November to February. Uh, it doesn't state uh, indoor soccer at all. So uh, we have requested some space for indoor soccer, but uh, we will be on 
a last, uh, even though we're a youth organization, they don't consider it a priority sport. I don't know when you play indoor soccer. Do you, I don't think you play it in the summer when it's hot. I think you usually play it in the winter. So uh, I don't understand why we weren't contacted or this wasn't included. Also on the spring sports, uh, the same is uh, put down here where we are not included at all here. Uh, it's traditionally uh, a year-round sport throughout the whole world. Uh, running is a, a seasonal, is not a seasonal sport. You can do cross country, you can do indoor track, you can do spring track. Okay, I don't see any difference at all in soccer that is the most popular sport in the world and I think it uh, has been overlooked here. Uh, besides that, the regional play throughout this country is done in the spring. And uh, this is when college coaches do 70% of their recruiting is watching players play in the spring. They don't have time to watch you play in the fall because they're coaching their own teams. So 70% of their time has come to watch players that play in the spring. Traditionally, the older K players have had to go out of town and play on a select side teams. Uh, the Casco Bay Soccer Club is continuing up through the youth age groups into the high school ages over the next few years. So this will put some more uh, stress on the fields. But I think it's uh, important in these kids' uh, soccer career and possibly contribute to their uh, ability to get some education, uh, financial aid if they are given the tools to practice and play in the spring and in the winter. So I just would uh, hope that there could be some uh, changes in these uh, procedures that are done right now. Thank you. We'll forward the petition and your comments to the appropriate boards. Okay. Yes, uh, I just wanted to, how many students, how many youth do you have involved in this program? There are uh, 257 uh, players playing under the age of uh, 14. They have, uh, we have uh, 202 Cape Elizabeth residents. Uh, the others are from Scarborough, Portland, and South Portland. Uh, the majority being uh, about 50-something from South Portland. But we don't also use the fields in South Portland. We played 25% uh, of our home games were scheduled in South Portland fields this year. Uh, we do have some Cape uh, teams that exclusively play and practice in South Portland. They don't play here. We don't have the field space. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from citizens on items not on the agenda? There being none, we'll move on to reports and correspondence. Any reports or correspondence? Well, then I have some. <laughs> yes. Oh, Janet has one now? Okay, Janet. Pastor. Thank you. I just wanted to commend the town employees. I'm on the board of the Greater Portland, United Way of Greater Portland. They had their campaign recently, as I'm sure many of you are aware. There's a weekly newsletter put out during the campaign time, and my recollection is the town of Cape Elizabeth is the only town that I saw noted in this, and the town was being commended that the employees raised over $4,900, which was close to a 40% increase in what they had contributed in past years, and I really think that's commendable and outstanding. And I know that our fire chief, Phil McGoldrick, was in charge of the campaign for the town employees this year, and I would like to say well job. Yeah, well done by all. Um, Greater Portland Council of Governments, I was not able to attend the last meeting. The manager went in my stead. Um, it was a report by the auditors, and as far as I'm aware, there were no, re no, what's the word? no material weaknesses, which is always the good news of an audit report, and hopefully things are continuing well. COG is very healthy financially these days. Thank you. Anyone else? We have been notified that there is going to be a public hearing. The Cumberland County Civic Center hereby uh, schedules a public hearing on November 15th, 1995 at 7 p.m. That's this Wednesday evening at Cumberland County Civic Center, 1 Civic Center Square, Portland, Maine, to hear public comment on the preliminary request for a proposal 
to provide a supplemental name for the center for anyone who's interested in attending that. We also have a few little odds and ends from our uh, manager. Um, our Public Works Department Director, Bob Malley, is now the president of the main chapter of the American Public Works Association. He's worked long and hard on that. And as a reflection of that, his crew made 1,080 household stops over the two weeks during our fall cleanup. That is an incredible amount of work, only because it's so well organized. I also want to announce that the Town Council Subcommittee on Ball Fields, that's um, Irving Chapel and myself, have submitted to the manager a draft report of our comments on his um, evaluation of town-owned property that we as a town council will be having a workshop probably in January because we need to discuss this report but also to develop some policy issues um, related to any developments on those fields. Any other reports? If not, we'll move on to the meetings. Minutes of meeting 7 and 8 of 1995-96. Any additions or corrections to any of those meetings? I move we approve them. Second. Second. All in favor? It's a 7 0. Item number 60 to consider a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for approval of the 1996 Muscular Dystrophy Association Ride to the Light on Sunday, June 2nd, 1996 and take any necessary action. I see the chairman of the committee is here. Would you want to make a comment, Jeff? Thank you, Madam Chairman. My, name's, my name is Jeff Van Fleet. I'm chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, we approved the uh, MDA uh, right to light uh, at our last meeting. Uh, you have copies of those minutes. Uh, representatives uh, from MDA are here this evening to address any questions that uh, you may have regarding this affair. Uh, last year, there was some, or some concern, I guess, uh, uh, because of the fact that it was a, uh, a group of uh, several hundred motorcyclists coming into town on a Sunday. Uh, the Commission received no uh, complaints or uh, negative uh, feedback at all about this, quite the contrary. I think uh, Bob Malley at Public Works and other town employees were quite impressed with the way it was held, the way it was cleaned up, uh, and the general tone and, and tenor of the whole affair. Uh, so that's why we recommended uh, that uh, event uh, be approved uh, once again. This is done on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, there are some minor changes in procedure that will take place this year to facilitate uh, better traffic flow and parking, uh, but uh, uh, those representatives are here. If you do have a question, I turn it over to them. Questions from any councillors? Council McLaughlin. I do have a question that was um, <clears throat> asked of me by a citizen, and the and I also did not hear any complaints after last year's event. I heard something about the parking, but I understand that's going to be a little smoother this year. The question was, do any of these motorcycles, um, are they ridden without their mufflers? I'll ask, uh, motorcycles I'll are loud to come to the, enough, the but without mufflers, they're quite loud. <laughs> Good evening, Council. I'm Bill Galvin with the uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association at the regional office. Also with me tonight is Tiffany Jones Olson. She's the local uh, district director, and Susan Norton, who represents a family that's served by the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Uh, in regards to your question, um, I really don't know. All the all the uh, motorcycles that are involved with the event are registered vehicles. They have to be registered, inspected with their states, the various states that they come from. We do have riders from Maine. A, a large majority of the riders were from Maine. Uh, we did have some riders from um, Rhode Island and Massachusetts as well and also a couple from Connecticut. Um, so as far as I know, they all meet any type of uh, state regulations regarding um, muffler noise. Okay, if I can just, well, we're lucky we have the police chief here. Is it illegal to have the motorcycle without a muffler? 
Chief. <laughs> it's it's going to be uh, factory equipment, so I think we can install the factory sometimes that allow them to know about that. Yep. That's what it is about the state police. I would assume that they take full advantage of any violations. I'll be glad to report this back to the citizen who called me. Thank you. <laughs> I just, I would also like to, um, last year we had great support from all the surrounding communities, as well as Cape Elizabeth with working with the police chiefs. Um, we work with Captain Neil Williams, and that's how we want to iron out our parking. Um, Bruce Kempton and Don Weeks, Ranger Don Weeks, were very helpful too. And, of course, Bob Malley we work with on this. So um, I'd like to thank you. Last year's event netted over $20,000 for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And uh, we'd like to thank you for that support last year as well. Excuse me, I do have a question. Are you also, one of the concerns last year was how you were going to arrive at the fort and whether or not you'd be passing any of the churches on Shore Road. Right. Are you going to? Yes, arrive? we're going to consider that again. Uh, our rendezvous point, if you will, is down in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And what we do is plan to meet there and not start off until later so that all church services would be done. And we tried to contact um, any of the churches that were along the route to make sure that, to see when their last services were. Um, and it seemed to work out pretty smooth that way. The main uh, Turnpike Authority worked with us as well in uh, helping to coordinate that. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Council Linnell. Uh, just to respond to Councilor McLaughlin's uh, uh, question, uh, we should all, uh, we should buy American when we can. And I'm, I'm afraid that it's an American brand of motorcycle. Uh, the Harley Davidson sometimes sounds like it doesn't have a muffler. Any other questions? Councillor Reid. I just wanted to observe um, that I did see um, the procession, procession um, of the vehicles, and I was very proud that the uh, end spot was the um, Portland headlight, and I commend the efforts. Any other questions? If not, all those in favor of approving the use? Was there a motion? Oh, is there a motion? I'll move. Sorry. We approve. Second. All in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council. I do have information, too, so you folks can know where the dollars are going and helping out here in Maine, as well as uh, the research track. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item number 61 is to consider a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for approval of the MS Society Lighthouse Bike Tour on Saturday, June 8, 1996, and take any action. Mr. Van Fleet, do you want to give us a little background, please? I think this is the first time that uh, we've uh, spoken before the council and asked for permission uh, or asked for a, a vote of confidence in our decision to let uh, the uh, MS folks uh, hold their uh, bicycle rally. This is uh, you know, bicycles in the park. It's been done. Uh, it was done last year, uh, several years before that. I can't recall how many years. Uh, there are no muffler problems. Uh, it's, uh, it's well received. It's a low impact uh, event. Uh, again, we've had no complaints in the past. Uh, it's for an excellent cause. Uh, and uh, we just encourage uh, that, that type of activity, that type of nonprofit activity in the, in the fort. Thank you. So I don't believe there's, uh, there are representatives from that organization here. But, uh. Any comments from councillors? Councillor Reid. Um, I've worked very hard on this project and others for the um, Muscular Sclerosis Society. And should I not vote? No. Oh. I don't think it's a conflict. Do you, any of you feel there would be a conflict? If not, may I have a motion on this item? I, I move we approve this request for use on June 8th, Second. 1996. Second. All in favor? To 7-0. Mr. Van Fleet, one more time. To consider a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for authorization to spend the fiscal year 1996 commission recommended budget as outlined in the five-year capital improvement plan. I assume perhaps that uh, council members have a copy of that plan. They've seen that. Um, I guess a couple preliminary remarks. Uh, first, these 
are not all of the various ways that uh, various members of the Commission and uh, uh, citizens have uh, recommended that we spend money. As you might imagine, there are ideas that only test the imagination in scope and number. Uh, these, however, were pruned down from uh, numerous lists in the past that we've worked with, uh, and quite frankly, it represents a, a, uh, a spending within, within our means. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, uh, our charge was to look at spending the monies that are raised through the fees for parking from large events, for picnic shelter fees, as well as the rents on the two properties uh, in the fort. Uh, those uh, revenues are projected at uh, $25,000 for fiscal year 96. Uh, and you can see that's carried out through uh, the year 2000. Uh, several anticipated changes might uh, occur in, in latter years, but uh, I, th I think we should focus perhaps on the, the fiscal 96 approval. Uh, I think that's what uh, we're asking is, is that the fisc fiscal 96 uh, numbers be, be approved, but at least it sets out uh, our thinking uh, going forward. Uh, so the second thing I'd like to comment on is that although this is uh, couched in terms of a capital expenditure plan, some of these items here are, are truly maintenance. Uh, the uh, Third item, perhaps, is the Goddard Mansion repairs listed in fiscal year 96 and 97 at five and four thousand dollars. This is uh, this is some money that, uh, as footnote three indicates, had been set aside in the past specifically for Goddard Mansion, and is in that separate account. Uh, we're asking to start spending that money in light of uh, some engineering study that uh, we had completed recently. Uh, indicating that uh, perhaps some repair to lintels and, and other uh, uh, stone and masonry uh, repairs uh, might uh, uh, take care of some safety concerns uh, in the Goddard Mansion. So that's why those items are there. I would be happy to go down each of these items and, and give you our, our thinking on there if you felt that was helpful. I only have a question on one of them. All right, why don't we ask you a specific question? Sure. That would be all right. Council McGinney. Um, on the, uh, just very quickly, on the entrance road reconfiguration, without going into all the engineering details, what, briefly, what do you tend to do there? Uh, that, uh, <clears throat> from the beach uh, parking lot, Ship Cove Beach parking lot, up the hill towards uh, the flagpole and on towards the lighthouse. Uh, the stretch of road that parallels the low stone wall on the shore side uh, is a safety hazard, we believe. Uh, there is a sidewalk on the right as you come in, going towards the headlight, uh, nothing on the left. Uh, if you're down there observing the traffic flow, uh, anytime there's some people, many people will just hug that stone wall and keep going. Uh, to compound the problem, when vehicles pass, each other. Oft times the vehicle uh, on the shore side will have to go up the curbing just to make sure that they have enough space. It is a it's a restriction, a constriction, if you will, in the uh, in the road. Now, what we're proposing to do uh, is move the sidewalk that is currently to the right as you drive towards the headlight up on the grassy area. Put a sidewalk hugging the stone wall so that then you would have a clear walk from the beach on that left side of the road all the way up and then eventually coming down uh, meeting a sidewalk uh, that we hope can be constructed in the future from uh, the headlight so you'd be all on that side of the road. Uh, this design does a, uh, another thing. The master plan has in it a scheme for putting a boardwalk the original master plan, now a boardwalk on the shore side of that stone wall to keep traffic, foot traffic away. Uh, and for a number of years that was thought to be the way to go and people were enthused about that. Uh, we received a, a, an estimate, if you will, a, 
even a soft estimate on the cost of a, a boardwalk on that shore side of that stone wall, uh, and it was in the six figures. Uh, so we said this is a good way to, to take care of a, a traffic, a pedestrian flow problem, a traffic problem in that the road would be somewhat wider uh, and handle some safety concerns. That's good. Thank you. Very good. Other questions? <clears throat> and Mr. Van Fleet and the budget. Councilor McLaughlin. I want to thank Jeff and the entire commission for coming forth with this kind of information for us. This is exactly what I as a councilor have been looking for from you folks. Jeff and I had a good conversation on the phone last night and I told him I'd say this publicly too. <laughs> but I think this is very good work. Um, I know Bob Malley is the staff person you folks work with. I want to thank him also. This is the kind of information we need to know what you folks are up to and how the monies are being spent. Well done. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for me too. We have been waiting for a while, so it's encouraging. Good. Motion. Council McKinney. Uh, I move that we uh, accept the recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for uh, authorization to spend for fiscal year 1996 as outlined. <coughs> Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? To 7 0. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. As a part of um, having the town get acquainted with our different departments, we have begun a monthly. Um, report from the heads of the department. Last month it was Chief um, McGoldrick from the Fire Department and this month our Chief David Pickering from the Police Department will give us an update on the ex things that are going on in his area. Chief McGold Chief Pickering. Thank you. Um, I had four areas suggested to me and I thought they were all uh, good ones. Uh, the manager at the last department head meeting suggested uh, 10 minutes would be enough. However, I, I see that I could probably spend all evening on each one of these. So I, I thought what I would do is, is basically give an overview of these four points. Uh, I also got several calls from council members in the last uh, day or so uh, about specific questions and specific issues. So I thought there'd be uh, a lot of comments, a lot of questions about each of these uh, areas that I have bulleted. So. I'm going to hand out this handout uh, to you, uh, which again is an overview of the subjects I'm going to be covering tonight. And also, uh, I'd like to invite the public to uh, get a copy of this. They can stop by the office and pick one up and uh, ask any questions, and we certainly invite their input and, and concerns on any of these issues. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about the COPS FAST program tonight, the equipment replacement schedule, public safety building space problems and outline the staffing of the police department. Uh, a lot's been happening with the COPS FAST program. We have tried to uh, get some publicity out there as to what this program is, how it's constructed, uh, its mission statement, et cetera. There was a, a rather lengthy article in the uh, Cape Courier recently about the appointment of our uh, community liaison officer who was uh, the subject of this COPS FAST program. Uh, to back up just a minute, the COPS FAST program is a product of the National Crime Bill. And it was part of uh, federal funding designed to uh, put 100,000 police officers uh, on the streets across the country. These are not traditional law enforcement positions. They are all supposed to be um, community-oriented policing uh, efforts. Um, so in other words, we couldn't augment our uniform patrol with one of these positions. Uh, with the help of uh, John McGinty, who was working in the department at that time, uh, we put together a grant application. Uh, which was constructed around our substance abuse uh, policy, which the police department had put together uh, a few years ago. And the uh, government granted us uh, one of these positions. Uh, the funding formula is 75% uh, from the federal government, 25% from the town. So the town really capitalized on an opportunity uh, to explore a community policing officer with really very little cost uh, to the community. Uh, specifically, the community liaison officer, again, is a non-traditional uh, policing position. 
We envision the CLO to be uh, used uh, and concentrate on substance abuse issues, domestic violence, child sexual abuse uh, cases, and other intervention concerns which uh, the community liaison officer might be qualified for and can act as a resource in addressing these community concerns. Uh, the police department posted this job description as for applications in-house and in fact at that time we were hiring two police officers uh, as part of uh, to satisfy the attrition problem we had at that at that point in time with the police department and we looked to these candidates with an eye toward uh, perhaps selecting one of them for this CLO position or perhaps uh, um, selecting somebody that could mentor in this position and, and uh, take those responsibilities on at some point in the future. I formed a subcommittee uh, made up of uh, officers within the uh, police department. They uh, interviewed two individuals that had some um, interest in this position and recommended uh, to me that uh, Detective Jack Nichols uh, be appointed to that position. Uh, I took this recommendation and did in fact uh, appoint Detective Nichols as a community liaison officer. Uh, Jack has considerable experience in a variety of areas. He came to the uh, Cape Elizabeth Police Department uh, six years ago. At that time, he had had uh, three or four years on New York City Police Department and, in fact, was assigned to the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of New York City. Uh, in the last four years, Jack has uh, served as our detective. Uh, he's distinguished himself with several major cases, including a, a breaking a so-called national gypsy burglary ring, uh, which we got national attention for that. And, in fact, uh, there's been a, uh, a book written about <coughs> our efforts uh, in, that, uh, in those arrests. He all, Jack also commanded a regional task force that identified and arrested uh, three individuals for committing occupied home invasions. I can't think of anything more frightening to have somebody uh, come into your home while you're sleeping and uh, take your val valuables and uh, basically terrorize people. Uh, he was instrumental in making arrests that uh, uh, hopefully have taken some people out of circulation that committed at least, of these, at least two home invasions in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so he headed the task force on that. And he's also uh, successfully investigated and convicted several individuals for drug trafficking uh, as well as child sexual abuse. Um, since his appointment as uh, community liaison officer, Jack's been busy setting up his office, which is at 1226 uh, Shore Road. And this location was the best that we could come up with for a couple of reasons. Number one, we didn't have any office space for him uh, in the police department. Uh, we considered having him share the detective's office. There simply wasn't uh, any room nor any opportunity for <clears throat> you know, the support equipment that he would need for that position. Uh, secondly, we thought it would be good to have a, a uh, truly a community-oriented facility for this position. Uh, we had some confidentiality issues. Uh, uh, Jack will likely be dealing with some sensitive subject matter in his role as community liaison officer. Uh, so we thought that that would uh, allow him some privacy uh, to conduct that type of business. And it would also be a non-threatening atmosphere where people that uh, uh, might be in crisis or need intervention could uh, come without uh, fear of being identified or reprisal. So that seemed to work out well for us. Uh, he is in, uh, I believe it's room C over there and has uh, purchased some equipment, <coughs> uh, and office equipment. We have a computer right now that is on order, which he should be getting within uh, a week or so. Uh, along with desks, et cetera. So that is uh, up and running pretty much. Jack has met with several school officials, including elementary, middle school, and high school staff people, uh, as well as school board members, and in fact uh, met with you all not too long ago to outline his uh, vision and his, uh, what he felt his mission was uh, in this position. Uh, it's important to know, and I think it's important for the community to know, that uh, the community liaison position uh, is just that. It's, this is a community law enforcement officer. Uh, it is not Jack's role uh, to work directly for the school department. <coughs> he is uh, 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 to augment uh, their efforts toward uh, uh, substance abuse and reducing substance abuse in the community, as well as any other issue which might uh, come up or be identified through uh, the school. So. Uh, basically, he is going to be adjunct to the school, to various civic organizations, to this council, uh, and to the community at large. He still maintains his law enforcement authority and, of course, is still uh, a member of the police department. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is uh, what uh, we've done with the uh, COPS Fast Grant and the community liaison position. Would you like to uh, question these one at a time, or let me go through the whole litany of this? Why don't you go through your whole okay. report, I think, <coughs> and then the, we'll go back to all right. The uh, equipment replacement schedule. We are in a rather unique <coughs> position uh, as far as replacing equipment in the police department because, of course, being 
uh, a 24-hour a day service, 365 days a year. Uh, we don't keep equipment for a real extended periods of time. Unlike the fire department that might maintain a truck for 20 years, uh, we're looking at putting on 80 to 100,000 miles on a police cruiser, for instance. So uh, there are several areas that I've identified here to speak specifically about that caused me some concern uh, over the next year or so, and I wanted to advise you of that. Uh, and the first is police cruises. Uh, presently, we have three marked police cruises, uh, two unmarked police cruises, one that I use myself, the second is assigned to the detective, and we have uh, a fifth vehicle, which is uh, basically a, it's a passenger vehicle. Uh, we uh, received that vehicle, uh, uh, in fact, in that gypsy case that I mentioned earlier, and uh, managed through asset forfeiture to get it for the town. Uh, we have put some money in, into that uh, particular vehicle to make it roadworthy. However, it is used uh, throughout a variety of departments. Do have access to that if they have to go to Waterville or to a, uh, a meeting or something out of town and don't want to use their vehicle, then that is available for their use. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, in an attempt to restrain the budget as much as we could, uh, we went one year without trading vehicles. And what we did was purchase two vehicles early in the spring. Uh, we stockpiled those vehicles until the two uh, cruises we were driving uh, literally fell apart on us and then we pulled them out of mothballs and put them back in service. Uh, in hindsight, that was probably a good decision because many police departments uh, today are looking at vehicles with 150 or 200,000 miles because these cars are under service as late as they did. Uh, we're looking at around 80 or 90,000 miles presently on existing cruises. <coughs> um, we are going to be having an issue in the next year or so. Uh, historically, Chevrolet has been the low bidder. We receive these vehicles through uh, a joint bid through the Council of Governments. Council of Governments puts, to, puts together the specs. Uh, we are able to enjoy some uh, uh, bulk purchasing uh, benefits. I think the, the vehicles are a little bit uh, cheaper in uh, uh, this type of bid. COG, however, does charge us $300 per unit as an administration fee, but we're able to get some uh, options on these vehicles that we couldn't justify as a single purchaser, for instance, power windows, which come standard in the package when you order X number of cruises. Uh, most communities in Greater Portland capitalize on that uh, Council of Government bid. Um, we're looking generally around uh, $18,000 per cruiser now. Uh, they went up almost $3,000 within one year, uh, and that was, that was last year, uh, because of various funding formulas that the dealerships had. The problem that's going to come up is that uh, Chevrolet is no longer going to make a rear-wheel drive vehicle. All of the vehicles are going to be front-wheel drive after the 96 production year. Uh, the vehicles are, are seriously being downsized. Uh, we have looked at uh, Chevy Luminas as a, uh, a possible replacement for these cars and find that the cages that go in uh, on the back seat won't fit. Uh, in these types of vehicles. In fact, there's absolutely no leg room to get anybody in the back seat. So uh, uh, Don Tubbs, uh, Sergeant Tubbs, is our uh, guru as far as automobiles go, and I've set him out on a mission to look at some alternatives. Um, Ford does have uh, a police package. Uh, we expect Ford to go the same way that Chevrolet did in the next year or so and only make a front-wheel drive downsized version. So uh, we may be looking at some rather uh, significant alternatives, or at least studying, studying some options uh, of non-customary police vehicles. Um, and when that data is in, why we'll certainly share that with you. Uh, and we get many things to consider as far as performance, efficiency, uh, you know, mileage, all of that. So we're looking at those, those various uh, things. The cruises that we do trade, uh, typically we get between two and three thousand dollars for. That's also a competitive bid and we have several sources that we advertise to and they come up and uh, bid on these cars. Uh, that's really quite high as far as resale for police cruises uh, and I think it's partly due to our, our public works department maintains them very well. We also have a very strict maintenance schedule which we try to maintain so uh, we do have some offsetting revenues when it comes to uh, police vehicles. Um, the second area in uh, equipment replacement I want to speak about is computers. Uh, presently, we have several types of computer systems in place at the police department. The first system I want to talk about is about nine years old now. That is a networking computer system. Uh, we have uh, computer terminals, of course, in the uh, uh, dispatch area, uh, my office, the shift commander's office, the detective's office. Um, I have in my 1997 capital improvement plan uh, funds to replace that system, and in fact, uh, I guess we 
Uh, figured it about right because we've got a couple of computers now that are down and, and really uh, is not worth, are not worth replacing uh, or repairing, I should say. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to, to keep that system up to speed. That in-house networking system uh, we use for word processing, for database management, and for spreadsheet work. Uh, and they are very well used. And I think the fact that uh, neither myself nor the uh, fire chief uh, having, has a secretary suggests that the system is working well. I, I simply couldn't function without it. Uh, I'm able to do all of my own correspondence, uh, all budgeting, all that, that type of uh, work on this system. So that's working uh, quite well. And again, when it's replaced, I'm sure it'll be more efficient and, and have a lot more uh, uh, technical capabilities. The second system is a standalone system. Uh, our teletype system uh, serves off a uh, AT&T 6300. Uh, that, again, was purchased eight or nine years ago. Uh, we have a maintenance contract uh, on that uh, particular system, and I would expect to replace that as well in 1997. Uh, the third system is a standalone MAC, which serves uh, the fire department, basically. Uh, the fire chief has all of his hydrant flows and hydrant locations and uh, uh, fire and rescue run protocols and all of that type of information in there, which the dispatchers can call up uh, in an emergency and have that uh, information instantly available to them. By next year, we expect to have a fourth computer system, uh, which will be located in dispatch. And that will be to accommodate the enhanced 911 telephone system that we expect to, to come in. That system, fortunately, will be free to us. Uh, it will not be free to telephone subscribers, as there will be a surcharge, which I think is, has been reduced around 20 cents per uh, telephone user, which is going to support this 911 system. So all of that equipment will be part of that. Uh, the, the municipality will not have to spend any more money for that particular system. Uh, it is expected, and this is something that is not finalized yet, it is expected we will have to uh, maintain it, however, so we may have to have some monies in our budget to uh, maintain that, that system when it is installed. Um, the third area is radios. Uh, we are fortunate. We presently have uh, five mobile radios and 15 portables, uh, all of which are, were new in the last couple of years. We have a uh, state-of-the-art repeater uh, system located on Spurling Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. We would expect to replace this equipment about every seven years. Um, again, it's used 24 hours a day, and it's something that's uh, certainly a very, very critical piece of equipment. So uh, we expect that that would be the normal life expectancy of this radio system about every seven years. Other office equipment that we have uh, includes electronic typewriters, and we have to type uh, multi-part forms, uh, a copy machine, which generates about eight to 10,000 copies per month. Uh, which also has been replaced, uh, in fact, in the last uh, three or four months. We have a, uh, a TDD, uh, telecommunications device for the deaf, which uh, we maintain at public safety, uh, that is used to assist the hearing impaired in an emergency, um, along with dot matrix printers, laser printers, which of course work off our computer system, telephone and radio recording equipment, as well as uh, customary desk chairs, that type of uh, thing like that. Generally speaking, the electronic equipment that we have for office uh, support uh, has to be replaced. And that depends on what the equipment is. Uh, for instance, every four years in the case of the copy machine, uh, to about every eight years in case of electronic typewriter. So uh, that's kind of a rundown on, on the equipment that we have and uh, the replacement schedules that we have for it. <coughs> the third area that I want to talk about tonight is public safety building space. Uh, of course, there is a subcommittee that has been formed to uh, investigate the, the space needs of the fire department and the police department. And I was trying as best I could to identify the reasons why uh, we seem to be uh, seriously lacking in space over there. Uh, the present facility that we have uh, now was built in 1976, and we occupied it in 1976. Uh, I think we outgrew it about five years after that period of time. <coughs> Uh, but since then, things have become uh, much worse in terms of efficiency and being able to accommodate the officers and all of the, the, the mission of the police department. And I identified some reasons that I feel uh, credit the situation, and, and one is staffing. In uh, 1976, we had 10 officers. Uh, these are full-time positions, by the way. 10 officers, four dispatchers. Then we had three reserve dispatchers, three reserve officers, and a part-time animal control officer. Uh, today, we have 13 police officers four full-time dispatches, uh, four reserve dispatches, four reserve officers, one full-time animal control officer, uh, as well as the fire police unit, all of which 
uh, share the resources <clears throat> in that police department and come and go uh, to do uh, uh, their business and to uh, support the mission of the police department. So in terms of staffing, uh, we certainly have more people there. Uh, second thing that I think impacts on uh, this uh, uh, problem with that facility is we are operating, of course, under several mandates, uh, one of which, which is uh, ADA, and it was necessary for us to take some of the existing space uh, to accommodate uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, you know, down, uh, opening doors up, uh, we had a um, uh, had two uh, bathroom facilities. It is now a uh, gender-neutral bathroom facility. Uh, so when that all takes space to accommodate th those types of facilities, so that's one reason why I think we're, we're, uh, we've lost some space there. Uh, the other gender equity concerns, uh, when we had our female officer, uh, it was necessary for her to, for her to change uh, in the bathroom or wait until, of course, the male officers left uh, the squad room. So we had some concerns uh, there. Uh, reporting requirements, you know, basically keeping uh, all of our reports and uh, being able to catalog them in various places. Uh, uh, created some uh, space concerns. Uh, freedom of access laws uh, required us to keep more records and to keep them for longer periods of time. Recycling efforts, uh, now we have to have space to, for all the recycling materials that we handle there. Uh, so any one of these things might not necessarily uh, concern us too much. Taken collectively, uh, we're chipping away at the available space that we had in that facility. We need uh, more offices, of course, means more personal equipment. We need more locker space. Uh, we have more briefcases there, more shoes, more boots. Uh, also because of the uh, liability issues that we have, we're involving our reserve officers and reserve dispatches considerably more than we ever used to. We basically uh, consider them as full-time employees in terms of sharing information, in terms of training, in terms of making uh, equipment available to them. And to not do that, I think, exposes us to some liability. Uh, so we, we basically uh, increased staff and increased uh, the support necessary for that staff uh, uh, manyfold. Um, we have specialty assignments, and uh, those specialty assignments now mean special equipment, uh, investigative equipment, and we try to take advantage of uh, uh, technological improvements in equipment. Uh, accident reconstruction equipment, of course, uh, takes time, and we uh, you know, add a vital alarm to inventory or uh, 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 camcorders, tape recorders, uh, cameras, that all needs to be stored somewhere and now that is taking up space in our, uh, our photo lab uh, which is also <coughs> being used uh, uh, as more or less a, a lunch room, break room where somebody can go in and make a cup of coffee or uh, have their lunch or whatnot. Um, we also have uh, a hazmat and bloodborne pathogen equipment, decontamination materials. Uh, I look in the trunks of those cruisers now and compare, uh, compare what we have in there today with what we were carrying when I came on board in 1973, and I can tell you we can barely shut the lids of these vehicles now. Uh, all of this equipment is, of course, necessary. Uh, we are fortunate that all of our offices are emergency medical technicians. We have defibrillator equipment now in the cruisers, uh, but along with that we have to have all the decontamination equipment, which is also a, a mandate. So just more space to uh, uh, inventory that material and keep it on hand uh, in supply. And just inventory storage in general, uh, paper, uh, other uh, office supplies that we need to have uh, instant access to, building maintenance equipment now that we didn't have uh, in years past. Uh, snow blowers, uh, floor buffers, those types of, that type of equipment all takes space. Uh, in records alone, uh, we take about a thousand complaints a year <coughs> on average. Uh, the supporting records and requests are also something that we have to maintain. We get, uh, of course, I don't know how many requests I get a day, maybe three or four from insurance companies uh, requesting uh, accident reports, complaints of, uh, of individuals that have been burglarized or whatnot. All of those requests, of course, have to be maintained as, as lo along with uh, requests from uh, attorneys, etc. So we're maintaining those types of records. We have over 150 accidents a year. Uh, the original accident report, as well as other information, has to be uh, kept on file. Personnel and payroll records. <coughs> and I've estimated that since 1976, when we moved into that building, we've compiled an additional 25,000 records. Uh, many of which are multi-page and take up a considerable amount of space. Those records have been taken out into what used to be our evidence processing bay. We no longer can put an automobile in to process it if it was stolen or used in a burglary. We either have to do it outside 
uh, or hope that uh, one of our neighboring communities might be able to assist us in that effort or we might be able to use the bay at the uh, highway department uh, from a, an investigative standpoint, from an evidence processing standpoint, uh, and a prosecutorial standpoint, that's certainly not the best thing uh, to have occur. And finally, the operational concerns. Uh, we have uh, need for interview rooms. We have needs for uh, reference book storage, physical training facilities, which uh, seems to be the trend today and uh, assists us in keeping workers' compensation claims down. Workspace for officers completing their reports uh, is uh, at a premium very often. And just some place where uh, a private citizen can come in and complete an accident report uh, with some private privacy without being disturbed. Uh, can be uh, difficult uh, the way this uh, facility is designed right now. If you go to South Portland Police Department, for instance, and want to make out an accident report or complete a statement, uh, they have uh, semi-private cubicles there off the lobby, which uh, I think is, is quite convenient and is a good uh, feature for the public. <coughs> they don't have that. If there isn't an office available, then they have to try to do it on this little counter space that we have uh, in the front lobby. Uh, and finally, we share offices over there, uh, the captain as well as uh, the other uh, shift commanders share one office. As I've already mentioned, our community, <coughs> excuse me, our community liaison officer uh, was uh, more or less taken away from the building uh, uh, for w one of the reasons being there simply wasn't space for him. So uh, that can create problems as well. So all in all, uh, I think those are some of the things that have contributed to uh, the loss of space which we have there. Uh, the physical plant uh, in the department, I don't think, is in too bad a shape. We've had uh, a pretty aggressive uh, maintenance schedule, um, and I think we've, we've managed to, to keep up the, uh, uh, the services over there. However, it's, it's simply a storage space issue, uh, an efficiency issue, uh, uh, an office space issue, which is, is creating some problems for us. The final area which was identified for me was uh, outline of the department staffing. Um, the department, uh, since I guess 1950, 52, has had uh, a chief of police. Uh, about uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, I guess, uh, I created a captain's position with the uh, help of uh, the council and the manager. Uh, the captain is actually the second in command of the police department. He is not represented uh, by any labor union or association, so he is truly uh, a manager uh, and assists me. Uh, in the management of the department and of course acts uh, in my behalf when I am away. We do have three sergeants uh, and that's not a magic number. Uh, we have three sergeants basically to cover the three shifts that we maintain 24 hours a day. Uh, we now have seven patrol officers, one of which uh, serves as detective and I want to talk about that just uh, briefly this evening. Uh, the detective's position that we, had <coughs> we have is more or less part-time. Uh, the detective has uh, road responsibilities as a uniformed officer on Sundays and Mondays. Uh, Sundays are problematic uh, for him in that role because uh, very often Sundays are the day that you can find people home and get statements and uh, can collect uh, evidence and, and talk to people you have to talk to because uh, customarily they're not working that day. However, with uh, his having road responsibilities on Sunday, he's very often called uh, away from those duties. So Sunday and Monday is, uh, is a difficult uh, time for the detective. Also, detective serves as our uh, court officer, as our juvenile officer, um, which is on Tuesdays. So as a practical matter, the detective really has two days to do follow-up investigations. What I had hoped to do through the community liaison officer <coughs> was make that officer available uh, to assist uh, uh, in those, uh, those two days when the detective might be working on the road. Uh, we are not, not at this time able to do that and I think that uh, Jack needs at least until uh, this June uh, to give full-time attention to the CLO position, get it up and running, make the contacts that uh, he has to make uh, to ensure the success of that, uh, that project. Uh, at some point, however, I think we are going to have to seriously consider uh, looking at this position as a full-time detective's position. Uh, and we may be able to design something through, uh, through with existing staff, through scheduling, so that uh, he can dedicate uh, five days doing follow-up work as a detective. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do have one community liaison officer. That position has been funded for the next three years. Um, I would assume at that point uh, the council would take a look back and see what we have accomplished and uh, either recommend that the, the position be funded, uh, uh, continued or not. We do have uh, four 
full-time dispatchers, which of course provide 24-hour service. Uh, not only do they dispatch for the police department, but they also dispatch for fire and rescue. Uh, recently, we have considered uh, training these dispatchers in, in, as uh, medical emergency dispatchers, which uh, requires considerably more training than, uh, than they have today, and that might be another benefit uh, to the community. We have one utility officer who acts as an animal control officer and also provides uh, maintenance for um, the police department, the fire department, and in fact uh, does some work around town hall and during inclement weather. Uh, has been very much an asset to uh, the department because those types of uh, uh, duties would take time away from the patrol officers, so uh, that has uh, evolved into a full-time position. We have four reserve dispatchers and four reserve patrol officers who augment our regular staff. Uh, we have two um, uh, school crossing guards that work down on Scott Dyer Road uh, that assist us during school hours. And we have eight uh, part-time fire police officers. And if any of you were around this weekend, uh, you would know how valuable uh, they are to us. I think uh, we had six of eight um, fire police officers out directing traffic around all the down lines and, and everything uh, in, in some very nasty weather, and they, they certainly uh, deserve some recognition for that. <clears throat> had they not been available to us, uh, we'd had no alternative but to call out additional police officers on overtime just to cover this, uh, the traffic and whatnot. So they're very beneficial, very helpful to us. And we have a uh, part-time harbor master who also comes under the police department. Uh, and the, about the only office space he has there resides uh, in a, uh, the voicemail system, but uh, does come in from time to time, certainly in the spring of the year. Uh, it's very beneficial and useful and, and uses our facility as well. So that in a nutshell is uh, the department staff, and I would certainly entertain any questions in those four areas you may have. Thank you for a very complete report, Chief. Um, certainly is a very busy office. I believe there was one question down at the end of the day is Council McGinty, I see your hand up earlier. Actually, a couple uh, comments and, uh, and then a question. Um, I wanted to commend the Chief on the appointment of uh, Detective Nichols to the CLO position. Um, in the several public meetings I've been at, and uh, individuals have approached me and, uh, and complimented you on that appointment. They're very pleased. I have not heard a negative comment yet um, regarding his appointment. Um, um, and also your appointment uh, to detective of uh, uh, Andy Steindl, who uh, is now taking uh, yes. Jack's place. So uh, I think that's uh, off to a good start in that regard. Um, regarding the detective's position, um, I have a couple questions I hope you can answer. Maybe the town manager can, can answer. Um, I went back to the archives and pulled <coughs> out some of your reports from 1988 and 89 regarding detective's position. And in fact, you lay out, I have it here in front of me, it's, it's quite, uh, quite comprehensive and um, quite convincing. I'm sure if I was on the council at that time, I would have voted for a full-time detective. Um, and uh, you make a, a very good case for it. And in fact, today you could probably just change the date and with the figures being a little bit different, but the, the argument is just as compelling mm -hmm. today as it was in, in 1989. I also have the manager's uh, budget message that uh, indicates that the additional position would be approved to make the detective's position full-time. And reviewing the budgets since that time, since uh, actually this is in 89 for fiscal year 90, um, that the detective's position has been funded uh, every year, including this year. And I guess my question is, if we funded it previously to be a full-time position, why is it not a full-time position now? It was, was not identified as a full-time position after, I believe, 1991, 1990-1991, uh, when we did reduce staffing. That's also when we lost Buster. Uh, at that time, uh, we were looking to save money, and uh, that position uh, was returned back to a part-time position. This, we had a full-time detective, in fact, in 1976. It was you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it was uh, me prior to that, and then it was uh, Dick Morin uh, had that position for a time. So uh, n numerically, sometimes it's tough to justify uh, this position, because if you look uh, over the years, our complaints have not increased appreciably. However, uh, because of 
Uh, you know, issues in town as far as the uh, district attorney's office goes, case preparation and, and what is necessary. Uh, and for some reason, cases become more complex today. Uh, and simply preparing cases for trial, uh, you know, all the juvenile issues which we have now, uh, which uh, 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 has, has complicated things terribly, it takes a lot more time to work up a case today than it did a few years ago. So simply based on the numbers, uh, we couldn't justify a full-time position. In other words, we have, they haven't increased. Uh, in terms of case by case, I think we can. I think we certainly could uh, justify putting somebody in that position for uh, five days a week. We're also attempting to uh, do what we could about overtime, and overtime is always an issue which uh, we wrestle with, the council wrestles with, I wrestle with, the finance committee uh, wrestles with, and that was one way that we had to try to uh, reduce overtime, was to bring that back to uh, uh, you know, a part-time position. So, in other words, they still have that duty, but uh, still have road responsibilities two days a week. Um, again, uh, this is right out of your almost essentially regurgitating the report you made. You said all those things, and again, I agree with them 100%, um, including the overtime concerns that uh, um, you said uh, overtime concerns, hiring a seventh patrol officer, which we currently have now, yes. or I guess that spot is vacant, but we're in That's the process right. of hiring. Process of hiring. Um, <coughs> will not only allow our detective to spend the time necessary to improve our performance in those areas, but it will also reduce many of our overtime accounts. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is, and again, I, I brought a copy of the, uh, the budget that I picked up from the town manager today, and I'm concerned that it identifies that we have a detective, and yet um, you know, we all agree, or at least I, mm -hmm. we agree, mm -hmm. two of us sure. agree, that we need a full-time detective. Sure. And, um, you know, I would personally like to see that, uh, if we're going to budget for that, I'd like to see that happen. And, you know. I think we can debate that at budget time. Well, Any other well my, my, my point is that apparently it has been debated at budget time. Right. Okay. But we're not going to do it tonight. That's okay, fine. Think. Just wanted to make the point. Okay. Any other comments? Councilor Reed. I have a um, question for the chief regarding the role of the CLO. Um, I imagine that a lot of this focus will be on the teenagers yes. in this town, and um, I'll use this opportunity to reiterate what I said to you earlier today. Uh, without a whole lot of notice, our teenage population is the fastest growing popula population in Cape Elizabeth, and we have to understand that this group, not just the at-risk teenagers, although the CLO and I discussed that all teenagers are at risk, um, some are just closer to the brink than others. And I would like to know, um, will the CLO uh, have time uh, to work with some of the social issues um, for the non-law-breaking teenagers and the other youth of town, do you think? I, I, think, he, I think he will, uh, which is another reason why um, I think it's going to work well at his, his offices at 1226 Shore Road. Uh, we would, uh, you know, I don't want to use the term drop-in center, uh, but we want an opportunity for, for teenagers to go in and discuss issues which, you know, might not be of a criminal nature. Uh, we think it will be beneficial for uh, teenagers as well as for Jack and his role as community liaison officer to identify those, you know, ancillary type of issues which, uh, uh, you know, don't require, you know, going to court over. Um, and we think that it might be a way to Run, in, run interference on a lot of the issues which, you know, fester over the years and, and become a problem for us. So, yeah, I, I think that will be, uh, he'll have an opportunity to discuss those kinds of issues with teenagers. And also, uh, his working through the schools will provide that opportunity as well. Um, we're trying to feel our way along with this. We, there hasn't been uh, many positions in the state uh, to give us any guidance on this. Uh, there are some things which we have to concern ourselves with, and one is, is confidentiality issues, uh, you know, what we can discuss with, with teenagers, for instance, without their parents having knowledge of. Uh, when do we intervene with the school? How does that work uh, as far as our responsibilities with the Department of Human Services? There are all of these, these, these problems and concerns that kind of dovetail. So what we're going to be able to do legally, uh, what we want to do uh, as uh, as a product of this position, I think, uh, remain to be uh, explored. But I know uh, that Jack has every intention of, uh, of exploring all those avenues and making himself available in those situations. Thank you. I, I do want to concur with Councillor McGinty. Um, 
everyone who's spoken to me about this, and believe me, people are speaking about it, so that's good. the good news, uh, are very excited about your choice. And good. I think that will um, certainly help to make the program work. We have high hopes. Thank you. Comments or questions for any of the counselors? Councilor Linnell. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, a couple of quick, quick uh, comments. I would like to echo also the, the uh, enthusiasm for the, for the com community liaison officer position. And I'm real optimistic uh, that, uh, that uh, it, it will uh, uh, really improve the situation. And I just had a quick question. Uh, as far as new vehicles, do you recall off the top of your head what the setup is? I mean, the, what a setup cost is to make a, a car or a police? It's, it's roughly $500. Uh, that includes oh. uh, stripping one car of the radios, installing it in a new car, plus the striping on the sides, those appliques. Uh, that's, that's what's included in the setup. It's about $500 per car. Do you, would you, do you anticipate that we would, if, if we can't go with Ford and Chevys, we might be looking at a foreign car? Is that... That was one of the options uh, also. It's all right with me. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> we, we can buy American on, when we need motorcycles, yeah. but. Uh. There have, yeah. there have been bicycles. police departments that have explored uh, those options. And in fact, uh, Volvo, for a period of time, made right. a police package cruiser. In fact, it was a turbo. And uh, performance wise, it was an impressive set of wheels. Uh, it was also relatively expensive to fix. Uh, but most of uh, the departments that bought those, purchased those, drove them 200,000 miles. So there's, there's probably some savings. However, uh, they've gone out of that business and uh, the cars are not set up for police work. So we're not sure if there's going to be, you know, a company like Volvo or whatnot, which might make a police package, you know, considering that there's about 60,000 police cruisers yearly that are sold in this country. So uh, without anyone to address that market, I would think it'd be an opportunity for manufacturers, you know, to. Uh, to improve or to modify their existing vehicles so that we could purchase them and use them in police work. So, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Mr. Oh. Councilor McGinty? Where do we stand on the purchasing cruisers this year? Good question. Uh, we were going to purchase uh, Fords at one point because that was going to be the only thing available to us. Let's see if I can get the numbers right. I think Ford had uh, set aside around 20, 25,000 vehicles that they were going to set up for police use. They had commitments, I think, on 15,000 when I was first notified this, about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was one primary dealer, uh, I believe it was in Augusta, that was handling uh, Ford Cruisers. We called them. Uh, he was reluctant to uh, guarantee which, that we could get the vehicles anyway because it was so late uh, in ordering them. And this isn't late, by the way. Normally we haven't told uh, January. The problem was that he required the money up front and, uh, or, or upon delivery, which was going to be uh, around um, March or April. And I tried to convince him that we'd like to take delivery in July. Uh, he said we could do that, but we'd be paying, I believe it was $130 per unit interest per month, which certainly soured the deal. Uh, so right now we're, we're accepting, uh, should be accepting delivery of two new cruises. One is scheduled to be built today, in fact, I think, and one is scheduled to be built December 4th. So we'll have two new cruises by uh, January. So it's the next production year that we've got to worry about. Councillor Jordan. Yeah, just, just a quick comment to you, Chief. Uh, I want <clears throat> to say it and thank you for a very good report on it. And I'd like to know if... Uh, when, when your officer has a meeting, is it certain teenagers or if a teenager or a youngster wanted to sit in and hear what's going on, is that allowed or does he pick and choose his? When the CLO officer has a meeting? Yes. Uh, I, I think that's probably going to depend on the situation. Of course, it's, this isn't always going to be a, you know, a substance abuse issue where you might want to have you know, parents and uh, parents and juvenile, or parents and teenager. Uh, it might be a domestic violence issue, it might be a sexual abuse issue, it might be uh, any other number of topics. So I, I guess it would depend on what that the, the uh, subject is. We want to maintain as open an atmosphere as possible because I think the success of this position is going to uh, rely on, on people being comfortable, uh, being coming in, uh, you know, coming in and, and speaking to them openly and honestly. So uh, we certainly want to maintain that 
that open atmosphere. And one other thing, I just hope you can continue with America-made vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Massey Ferguson, something yes. like that. Right. I have a couple of questions, and you and I have had this conversation before, but I've had citizens ask me, so I need to repeat it. Um, what was the reason that you said it was not a viable option to lease mm -hmm. cruisers? Uh, one thing, I only know one department that has leased uh, police vehicles, and that was the city of South Portland uh, a year or so ago, uh, and that was mainly because uh, they, like the Cape, had gone for a year or so without purchasing new vehicles, and what they found is that their entire fleet just had too many miles on it, wasn't serviceable, and was in fact uh, getting dangerous. The quickest way uh, that they could uh, deliver new vehicles to the department so that they'd be all up to speed was to lease them. The reason why we don't lease is because uh, you are required to go under the manufacturer's leasing company, whether it be Ford or Chevrolet. Uh, customarily, they charge 6%, uh, and I don't know what we could get money for now, but I would be willing to bet 3 uh, or less. So uh, it, it's really not cost effective for us to do that. And in fact, I believe South Portland is uh, in the process of purchasing vehicles now instead of leasing them. So uh, the experience hasn't been good with other departments, and we capitalized on their uh, there are problems that they saw. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And also on 911. Yeah. Um, where are we as far as having the town, all the houses <coughs> and roads fully identified? Mm -hmm. Well, it's important that everyone know that we are not on 911. If you call 911 now anywhere within Cape Elizabeth, uh, you will get uh, the city of South Portland. Uh, it's important to know that because if you call South Portland from a location which South Portland shares with us or they have similar street names, uh, it could be a significant amount of time before that, that uh, mistake is identified and we can send people to that location. So it's important to remember that we do not have 911 now. Uh, people wanting emergency service should call 799-8581. Uh, right now there has been uh, identified uh, Stephen Bunker, who is the, uh, now going to be head up uh, E911. He is also serving in two roles because he uh, manages the State Uniform Crime Reporting Division as well. So <coughs> he's a pretty busy fellow. Uh, uh, they are still working on this uh, system. I understand that they have to have a final report in place to the legislature by uh, December, which should identify logistically how this is going to be uh, put in place. Uh, I would hope to have uh, equipment installed by next summer or next fall. Uh, the monies, I believe, uh, have been identified. They know what the uh, <coughs> excuse me, user fee is going to be uh, per telephone subscriber. Uh, that is not terribly significant. In fact, it's come down 30 or 40 cents uh, since the beginning of this project, uh, due mainly to you know, improvements in technology that they have made. So uh, we are hopeful that we will become part of the statewide E911 system within a year. One of the criterion is that um, each house and each street is specifically named. Yes. Where are we in that process? Jerry Daigle's done a considerable amount of work on that, and I think we're, we're pretty much up to speed. We had uh, uh, contacted Kevin McGinnis, who was the acting director some months ago, and basically ran down the shopping list of uh, the things that we were going to have to satisfy. And I think we were, uh, <coughs> uh, we were approved in every area as far as we got to have recording equipment, which had to be solid state, which we have. Uh, had to have full-time dispatches, which, which had to be trained, which we have. Uh, had to identify all of these locations, which uh, uh, Jerry Daigle has, uh, has worked diligently on. And uh, there may be one or two uh, locations yet uh, to complete, but by and large, all of that has been done. Good. Thank you. Mr. McGovern? I just wanted to comment in response to some of the concerns that we don't have a full-time detective. Uh, it, as I look at our entire town staff, it struck, strikes me that I'm not sure if there's a single position that is full-time doing one thing alone. Uh, when, when I look at, you know, the town clerk, she's also the, the de facto tax collector, the office manager, the administrative assistant to the manager, the cemetery director, I could go on. The codes officer also oversees all of our building maintenance, the chief of police uh, helps to do cross-training uh, amongst the different departments. and training different mandates with different mandates, not just in the police department. He also oversees the harbor master, very unusual, which is not a usual police chief duty. Our fire chief is our ADA coordinator. He also oversees a rescue, a wet team, and 
does all sorts of other things. Uh, dispatchers are uh, also the clerical folks of our department. They're the overall managers of our telephone system, troubleshooters when things go wrong there, as they sometimes do. Uh, one of the dispatchers also has a lot of computer expertise, and this, this summer uh, put, a lot, put a program together to do our, uh, all our cemetery records. You know, I could go on about public works, Bob Malley, all the different hats he wears and the different committees he goes to. And I, you know, I think it's, it, it's what's expected in this town is that folks will wear a lot of hats and that we won't have very distinct positions doing single things. You know, maybe at some point we, you know, we will need to have a dispatcher working a full 40, excuse me, a detective working a full 40 hours doing that. But, you know, as, as we look at all these issues, it would be nice to have a few more hours with, with everyone doing the single position. And we try to keep, you know, as much as possible the taxes in line. Uh, you know, during the last few years, that's been particularly a, a concern of the council uh, with the school project and uh, with sense of people with taxes beyond. And we plan to continue to do that. And, you know, we will take a look at the dispatcher, but uh, I think whenever we, uh, the detective, I want to keep saying dispatcher, <coughs> but whenever we use the, the, the appellation or description of uh, full time, uh, it's really a full time plus, plus, plus when we look at all the other hats going on. The detective is just another example of the way this town operates. Thank you. Ma we're not going to debate that. Madam Chair, I'd like to respond just uh, briefly, if I may. You no, know, we're not going to debate that now. We can debate that in a budget session. I think we all should thank the police chief for giving us um, such a complete report, and we appreciate knowing the depth of the de work and responsibilities that you have. Thank you. Thank you. On to item <coughs> 64, to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding the open space impact fee and take any necessary action. And I'll turn this over to our Ordinance Committee Chairman, John McGinty, to introduce to us, please. Madam Chair, on uh, June 20th, uh, 1995, the Planning Board sent to the Council a recommendation that the uh, open space impact fee ordinance be amended to uh, bring it more up to date and to uh, revise it and reformat it uh, due to some court cases, including a United States Supreme Court case. Um, the Ordinance uh, Committee has met and made a recommendation uh, for uh, reformatting and updating the, uh, the ordinance. It's uh, subsection 16-3-1Q of the subdiv subdivision ordinance. And uh, we'd like to set that for a public hearing for December 11th at 7.30 here at Town Hall. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, just set it for, oh, yes. No, thank you. Councilor McLaughlin. In the memorandum that we have from the Ordinance Committee, there is comment that this may be revi further revised at a later date. Do you want to just give us a couple of sentences more about that? Please? Yeah, it was the general consensus of the uh, Ordinance Committee that uh, we needed to more closely look at the types of property that uh, could be donated in lieu of the impact fee, um, how the impact fee should be used, and that we should probably have a uh, recreation plan for the community um, that we could better direct the acceptance of the property or the uh, Im impact fee uh, that would come in lieu of uh, donation of the property. How much later do you anticipate that would happen? It's uh, probably a, a lengthy process that we're going to have to look at uh, that needs to be staffed out as far as a recreation plan. So I, I couldn't say specifically, but um, uh, it may dovetail into the Zork process maybe uh, early next year or, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, March or April, something like that, all depending on when the staff work gets done. If I could ask the manager the same question, do, you, do we have a time frame for a later revision of this? No, I'm having a meeting tomorrow with uh, the planner, the code enforcement administrator, and the code enforcement officer, just generally discussing scheduling and when different things are going to happen. We have, we have this, perhaps the next item on the agenda, also some geographic information system issues and a couple other minor issues. And we plan to put together a schedule and discuss priorities. Okay, thank you. <coughs> 
Any other comments? All those in favor? It's a seven zero to set up public hearing at our December meeting. In my um, appreciation to the chief of police for presenting his report, I neglected for us to make um, a motion to acknowledge the receipt of that report. So Second. All in favor? The seven zero. On to item number 65, to consider referring to the Ordinance Committee responsibility for a review of certain aspects of the wetland shoreland provisions of the zoning ordinance and take any necessary action. I guess since Councilor McLaughlin was the one who requested this to be on the agenda, we'll let her introduce the item. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <coughs> Just to put this in a bit of historic perspective and some fairly recent historic perspective actually for the council, we had a workshop last week where we had a presentation of a geographic information service. Part of the interest to me, geographic information system, was that a good 30% of our town area is wetlands. That showed up very graphically in bold colors the other evening. A number of years ago when our wetlands ordinance was passed, we assured the public that we would revisit appropriate sections of that ordinance. And in light of that, I have asked that this item be on the agenda this evening. I believe it was two or three weeks ago, the council chairman and I made what I as a planner would call a site visit to a citizen's property, looked at the situation there where in addition to the house going towards the wetland had to be properly denied by the code enforcement officer but a house on the other side of a road, even closer to the wetland, could build an addition. And I'm standing there thinking, this doesn't make sense. The proposal was to put it over an already impervious surface. It wasn't adding any impervious surface. And it wasn't working for me. I was also aware that we don't have a process where a property owner could appeal for a variance which is very unusual. Even the state wetlands language has that appeals process. We happen not to. I think we need to take a good realistic look at portions of our wetlands ordinance. More and more property owners as they come to want to do things with their property are butting heads with parts of the ordinance. Not to say we have to change everything. It's very, you cannot write an ordinance to cover every single situation. We know that. That's why there's generally an appeals process. I also am very well aware that we're in the midst of an ongoing zoning ordinance rewrite process. It's my very strong desire to do this work <coughs> within the context of that process. It can be done outside the context perhaps even more quickly, but I think it makes a lot of sense not to do a lot of piecemeal amendments to this ordinance, as we've kind of been doing already, but to bring it within that process. And I've also had a conversation with <coughs> Council McGinty, who chairs the Ordinance Committee, to ask them about their workload. We did say that we were not going to overload that committee during the Zork process. My understanding from Council McGinty was that that committee was not very <coughs> busy. That, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you didn't feel <coughs> overloaded, if I can say that. <coughs> and I think it would make a lot of sense at this time to refer the items as they're proposed in the Council um, memo to the Ordinance Committee, have them come up with some policy recommendations for the Council, and then let the Zork Committee and either the town planner or the consultant come up with the technical language um, that would put the policies into the ordinance. I would like us to look at how we differ. We may differ from state requirements relative to setbacks, relative to uses, and also again to look at whether or not we could have an appeals process. Thank you. Comments? <coughs> Councillor Reed. I don't have the technical knowledge that Councillor McLaughlin has on the issues. 
Uh, but one thing that I would um, ask of the ordinance committee is to please, um, wherever possible, allow a, an appeals process. I, I am shocked um, that there is not an appeals process for ordinances uh, since um, no matter how well intentioned or how technically correct ordinances may be at a certain time, at some point situations may change and I always think an appeals door should be uh, available unless um, it's severe and I just would like to add that comment. And if that were a motion, Janet, I'll second it. Was that a motion? If you. I have a comment. We can still. Does that make sense to the clerk? To <laughs> that be a motion. Just one clarification: Are you putting a deadline? The deadline is, would be as presented that the ordinance committee report back to the council by next April, April ninety-six. And the chairman of that committee has not fallen off his chair with that. <clears throat> yep. With that a motion, Janet? Yes. That's a second discussion. Council McGinney. Um, I concur regarding uh, with both. Uh, Councillor uh, McLaughlin and Councillor Reed regarding the appeals process. I'm surprised we didn't have one either. And also, as the chair of the ordinance committee, um, um, when we just finished work on the uh, the wetlands um, non-conforming buffer zone, um, I have to take responsibility for having to try to do a good thing and, and put some common sense into the ordinance. But I'm inadvertently, when we did that. We had negative impact on some other people, and it certainly wasn't done intentionally. Um, but it just—I think—it shows the complexity of the issue, as as you said, that um, you can't make them all perfect. Um, but certainly, uh, our committee will do its best to try to uh, have the most favorable impact we can for for people, and again, add some common sense to the ordinance. So, Councillor Lanell. Thank you. I have a just a question for, I guess, Councillor McLaughlin, or anyone who has. More, would, more experience in this than I do. Um, and first, uh, I'm aware of the, the, the situation she uh, was talking about, and it, it did seem kind of ridiculous that one person on one side of the road further away from the wetland couldn't do something. Um, um, but uh, the question I have is, if there's an appeals process, does the appeal, the, the body that's looking at the appeal, do they, do they just uh, review the, I guess, the interpretation and, um, strictly? In other words, do they decide whether or not the, 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 the code or the, the rule or law was interpreted correctly or not? Or can they say, well, it was interpreted correctly, but we're going to uh, override that and, 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 and do something different because we think the, the other um, we, we, we think uh, it, the, the current statute doesn't make sense, if you can follow what I mean. There's yes. a difference between an administrative appeal, which would be an appeal of interpretation, and an appeal for a variance. Okay. In this case, there could have been an administrative appeal, but there was nothing to appeal. The interpretation was correct. Everybody involved agreed with that. There is no provision for variances, so it would be an appeals process for variances of setbacks primarily. Okay, thank you. Now, when you, when you do, if you, if you have the appeals process, and, it, and it, it seems to make sense to have some sort of appeal, it just, uh, does that, to what degree, or maybe this is, doesn't lend itself to a short answer, but uh, does that uh, sort of open the door towards a lot of uh, subjective rulings or something? Or in, in other words, does that sort of lead us away from consistency or does it bring us back to it or is that there are some very specific criteria for variance appeals um, I can tell you what the state language is the board should not shall not grant a, grant a variance unless it finds one the proposed structure or use would meet the provisions of section 15 which I don't have except for specific provisions which has created the nonconformity and from which relief is sought and the strict application of terms of this ordinance would re would result in undue hardship. Undue hardship, as people have gone through a zoning appeal, no, has four portions of it, and you must meet all four of those. That the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. The need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. 
that the granting of a variance will not alter the essential character of the locality, and that the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or by a prior owner. So it is not right. subjective. Thank you. I know, I know a lot more than I did when we started. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Jordan. I don't want to prolong this because I think it will come up at a later date, but I just want to say that I can remember back when somebody wanted to have a, some kind of appeal for a resident to be able to speak his piece, but the state has spoken and we can't do anything about it. And I'm glad to see that we're going to take and tackle it and not allow the state to run our lives. I just want to make one comment. There still is no appeal process for some of the um, wetland ordinances as far as the state's concerned. And the town currently finds itself governmentally in that bind. Um, but also, we want to remember that we made a promise to the staff when we began this ZOC process not to have any other large projects to be undertaken because of staff time. And this staff for the Ordinance Committee is, is our planner who is right out straight. So I'm not sure that even that April 96 deadline is, is reasonable. But also to keep in mind just the history of, of Cape Elizabeth and the way it's dealt with wetlands when they were R2. RP resource protection zones. Janet. My understanding is that the Zork Committee also has an outside consultant doing a lot of the work. They're doing Not a just with one staff person. The um, outside person is hired to deal with the Zork Committee itself and not with the Ordinance Committee, who worked closely with the planner. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other comments? Councilor Jordan. Yes. I would just like to say is that I think we ought to grab the bull by the horns and, and change this before April. Any other comments? All those in favor of forwarding it to the Ordinance Committee? All those opposed? 6 1. Item number 66, to consider proposed appointments to the Registration Appeals Board and take any necessary action. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Deborah Lane. Thank you very much. If you recall for a moment at your September Council meeting, you did make several appointments to the newly formed Registration Appeals Board. At that time, we did have one vacancy for the alternate member. Since that time, the Democratic Town Committee has recommended Ann Shank to fill the alternate member uh, again, represented by the Town Democratic Committee, a term to expire September 29, 1998. Since the September meeting, Pat Lang has resigned from the Registration Appeals Board, and at this time, the Republican Town Committee would like to put forth the name of Frank Gooch to serve as a regular member of that committee, again, a term to expire on September 29, 1998. I would recommend that you approve the, uh, these appointments. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? We all in favor? 7 0. Congratulations. <laughs> Item number 67 to consider a proposed amendment to the personnel policy regarding federally mandated drug and alcohol testing for employees with commercial driver's licenses and take any necessary action. Yep. Mr. McGovern. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. There's a new federal law going into. Uh, uh, place January 1 of 1995 re requires us to do drug and alcohol testing for employees with commercial driver's licenses. In the case of our municipal government, those are the public works employees, but it also involves the school bus drivers and the cables of the school system as well. Uh, we have formed a consortium with a number of other communities, Scarborough, uh, Westbrook, Gorham, Cumberland, I think Wyndham and Yarmouth as well who are going to be doing the drug testing together so we have the same random pool uh, in order to spread out the cost of it as well as to administer the program in a, in a much easier fashion. I'd like to really thank the town of Scarborough for organizing that. Uh, part of what's involved in this is that you need a, a local policy uh, of for substance abuse and, and how this would work. Uh, we have prepared one borrowing very, very, very heavily uh, from the city of Lewiston. 
the, the city of Lewiston has had this extensively reviewed. Uh, it has been praised by group after group as, as the route to go. So this is, we do uh, appreciate the city of Lewiston's work on this and uh, the opportunity to plagiarize their work. Uh, also do want to thank uh, Bob Malley and Scott Poulin for the help on, on this as well. So I would encourage you to uh, uh, t table this item for you to review it uh, and consider it at your December meeting since uh, it is a fairly major issue and one that uh, probably you should look at more than one opportunity. Do we want a public hearing format or not? A, an amendment to the personnel code, it's not necessary to have a public hearing. Okay. Is there a motion? One question, please. Yes. You want the motion first or a? No, that's fine. Go okay. Ahead. I'd just like to have the manager explain to me on page one, main law 26 MRSA 681-690, and you read the first sentence about the uh, <clears throat> testing, and they can be reassigned unless he is given a a opportunity to participate in a successful complete rehabilitation so you can do something. You go over the next page here and it says any employee who fails the alcohol test may, may be fired immediately and not offered an opportunity for rehabilitation. Doesn't one say a little bit different than the other? Yeah, on page one, uh, you note that the law as described above only applies to a person who fails a drug test, uh, where, where then you look at it's an employee who fails an alcohol test who may be fired immediately. There's different rules for alcohol tests than there are for drug tests. I thought, well, I guess interpretation of drugs is different. Well, you know, alcohol certainly is a drug, but for purposes of the definitions within these laws, uh, they're, well, they're treated separately. It's good an opportunity for attorneys in the future. Is there a motion? Well, I just have a oh. comment on this. Surely. I, I, I got the impression, I can't put my finger right on it, that in our proposed policy, we would treat the alcohol similarly. Even though in, in, in some, some main law, they didn't require alcohol to be treated as the drug. I, I got the impression that we would uh, give uh, someone who uh, failed an alcohol test the same opportunity uh, as, a, as uh, someone who had a problem with a drug with uh, other, other drugs, shall we say. You're talking about within this policy? When in, our, in, yeah. in the policy that we've borrowed heavily from mm. Lewiston, uh, we would treat them similarly drugs and alcohol yeah. in that respect, even though the, the state law doesn't require it. We're, we're going a, a step further, and I, I, I think it's commendable. Yeah. We, we have always had a policy prior to now for all employees of recognizing alcohol and drug abuse as a disease and encouraging treatment. I know we've had a number of employees over the years who have you know, been very fortunate to help uh, through some of these issues. and. Uh, you know, it, it's really worked well for us in the past to encourage treatment. Is there a motion on this item? May I make a comment, please? Okay, we're, trying, we're going to table it, so go ahead. Well, I just hope that in the state and also in any um, policy that we adopt that we can use uh, gender-neutral language. We can amend it so that it will read that way. Madam I'll Chairman, I move that we table this to our, for final action to our December meeting. Okay. All in favor? To 7 0, table to December. Just, if I might, I know you tabled it and I'm totally out of order. But, <laughs> well, it seems to be. But my, be my belief is, is that our draft policy is totally gender neutral. What the lawyer's letter explaining it is not. But if you have found an an instance of non-gender neutrality in our proposed policy, could you let me know? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for you're, that you're violation of the rules. Item number 68, to consider clarifying the lots covered by the public sewer service area that are owned by Juan Perez and related corporate entities and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern. 
Yes, when this last came before you, it was around the same time that we had changed map and lot parcel designation on the assessor's map. So as a result, one of the lots which was intended to be included was left out in the motion designating Juan Perez's land as a sewer service here. And we'd like to recommend you add R453. Uh, it, it met every description before that was in it except for the actual listing. It was fully intended to be included except the way the maps had switched approximately at that time. So we do that by amending the two separate items for that date to make sure that it just I'm just asking you to clarify it in this minutes by indicating that that was included in those motions. So moved. Second. All in favor? Is there a count on that? Name? Seven zero. Thank you. Item number 69, to consider approving a corrective abatement for fiscal year 1994 and fiscal year 1995. For you, 22-61, and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, in September of 1990, it, uh, there, was, there may have been a change in this lot. It may have been before that. I'm not sure. But anyway, our assessors may have sense that have been wrong. Under state law, uh, if a property is misassessed, in, inappropriately assessed, the assessor can grant an abatement in the current fiscal year. Only the council can do it for prior years, and then only the council can do it for two years previous. Uh, Mr. Daigle agrees that this, this particular property was inappropriately assessed due to a, an error on, on the town tax map. And he, he recommends an abatement of $54.87 for fiscal year 94 and, a, and an abatement of $111.51 for fiscal year 1995. This is for U22-61, property owned by John B. And, James C. McThenny. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? To seven zero. <clears throat> Item number 70, to consider approving a new lease for a tenant at the Keepers Quarters at Portland Headlight and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, this is for uh, a, a new party, the name is Glenn Jordan, the new tenant. To my knowledge, he's not related to any Jordan in Cape Elizabeth. He uh, has no, no ties here. Uh, he uh, has oh, you been, approve it. Cheryl Milligan, the museum director, has met with him. Uh, he very much looks forward to moving here. It is for $1,100 a month, and it would be beginning uh, January 1 of 1996. I move approval. Second. All in favor? 7-0. <coughs> Number 71, to consider a report from the Appointments Committee regarding vacancies on the Zoning Board of Appeals and take any necessary action. Um, Mr. Linnell, Chairman of the Committee, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, we, have, we had an opening on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, we had a very promising uh, uh, person in that uh, position uh, as a law student how, who had to move out of town and, and uh, therefore was not able to uh, stay on the committee. So uh, we have uh, interviewed uh, Jerry Petroselli. Uh, he's a, an attorney. He had served uh, very, very well on the, uh, in helping us develop policies for the Thomas Jordan Trust. And so the, the uh, appointments committee is recommending uh, Jerry Petroselli, fill a spot on the Zoning Board of Appeals. And that's my motion. I move approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? Just clarification. That was for a one-year term expiring on 12-31-96. Right. All in favor? Thank you. Opposed? 7-0. A 14-month term, actually. Item number 72, to consider approving the municipal warrants issued from October 9th 1995 to November 13th, 1995, and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, this is the monthly responsibility of the council under a law that passed in the last session. Is there a motion? Before I even make a motion, I want to encourage Senator Amaro <laughs> to do what she can in Augusta to delete this necessity. Thank you. She has. Keep going with it. 
In conformance with Maine statutes, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council does hereby approve the financial warrants for the Town of Cape Elizabeth from October 9, 1995 to November 13, 1995. The Town Council has received and reviewed a report on the status of the municipal budget accounts as of November 1, 1995. Second. Discussion? All in favor? To 7 0. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. There being no citizens present wishing to make a comment. There I'll is a, a citizen present. Not present wishing to make a comment. <laughs> um, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor? We Thank you for staying with the Senator Aramara. <laughs> I'm sure you have a comment. Good night, one and all. <laughs>